In the previous video, we saw how to discretize the Hartree-Fock equation. But at this level, the error due to the model can still be very large. In this video and the following one, we will see how we can reduce this model error by using information given in the resolution of the Hartree-Fock problem. These methods are called post-Hartree-Fock methods. In the fifth episode, we will present two of these methods called configuration interaction and couple cluster. But first, in this episode, we will explain some details on the finite dimensional spaces on which we would solve the Schrodinger equation if we could so in a discrete setting. The problem of finding the ground state of a molecular system is a minimization problem. The ground state is indeed the state with lowest energy among all states with norm equal to 1. If the molecule has n electrons, then the minimization runs over the space of all antisymmetric functions with 3n variables, 3 for each electron. Mathematically, the ground state of the electronic Schrodinger problem is the minimizer of the energy of the space called V under the constraint that the norm of the wave function is equal to 1. Since the expression of the energy is complicated, it is not possible to get exact solutions for systems with more than one electron. As already explained in the previous session, the space V is of infinite dimension, so even with a computer at hand, it is not possible to compute the solution for this problem. Therefore, the first step is to choose a finite dimensional subspace V delta of V on which we will solve the problem. In order to construct such a subspace, we first consider a finite dimensional subspace of H1 of R3, which is the subolef space of functions in R3. It is for example possible to use the bases that were presented in the previous session. And from there we built our finite dimensional subspace of antisymmetric functions of 3n variables. We call this subspace of H1 V1 electron delta. It contains functions of three coordinates corresponding to the position of an electron. The discretized space V delta of all the wave functions is now the antisymmetric tensor product space of V1 electron delta. This corresponds to antisymmetric functions belonging to the tensor product of V1 electron delta. This space is a finite dimensional space as well. Now, Ben will explain you how this looks like in a particular case. Let us explain this complicated notion on a simple example. We consider a global system with two electrons only, and that we take a three-dimensional space of one electron functions V delta one electron. I repeat, we have two electrons, and the dimension of the one electron space is three. We denote this basis of the one electron space as E1, E2 and E3. Each of them itself a function from R3 to R. But what is exactly the tensor product of the one electron space with itself? By definition, a basis of the tensor product of the one electron space with itself is spanned by the tensor products of the basis functions of the one electron space. In our example here, the basis is therefore composed of nine basis functions. We can recognize that we have combi combined all possible ways the E1, E2 and E3 with a tensor product. We recall that the tensor product of two basis functions, say EI and EJ, is given by the function that evaluates EI at x1 and EJ at x2. Hence, the basis functions of the tensor product space are simply products of basis functions of the one electron space. 
So here we have a list of all the nine basis functions. So f1 maps x1, x2 onto e1 evaluated at x1 times e1 evaluated at x2 and so on as you can see in this list. Hence, the tensor product space is the span of all these basis functions, thus all linear combinations of these basis functions. This can be rewritten in a more compact form as the span of all tensor products between EI and EJ, as you see here. Luckily, this definition of the tensor product space does not depend on the choice of the basis E1, E2, E3. By introducing a change of basis, in the one electron space, it is possible to show that any other set of basis functions span the same tensor product space. So we have here that the definition of the tensor product space is indeed independent on the choice of the basis for the one electron space. It is important to observe that the tensor product space is not the space of products of functions in the one electron space. Indeed, it is the space of all linear combinations of products of functions in the one electron space. For example, consider the function E1 tensor E2 minus E2 tensor E1. This belongs clearly to the tensor product space, but cannot be written as a tensor product of two functions belonging to the one electron space. However, by nature of our problem, we are only interested in antisymmetric functions of this tensor product space. So we recall the definition of antisymmetry that means that if we exchange the two variables, a minus sign needs to appear in front of the function. So here we give a definition of the antisymmetric part of the tensor product space, or in short, the antisymmetric tensor product space. In order to characterize this antisymmetric space, we first find a basis of the general tensor product space that only consists of symmetric or antisymmetric basis functions. Then we use the, the fact that symmetry and antisymmetry is conserved by linear combinations. So let us first remark that E1 tensor E1 E2 tensor E2 and E3 tensor E2 are already symmetric functions. Indeed, permuting the two variables does not exchange the value of the function, as you see here in this example. The, all the other basis functions are a priori neither symmetric nor antisymmetric. However, it is possible to recombine them in order to get symmetric and antisymmetric basis functions. For instance, if you consider E1 tensor E2 plus E2 tensor E1, this is a symmetric function, while E1 tensor E2 minus E2 tensor E1 is antisymmetric. So here you see that all the remaining basis functions, we reshuffled them in order to get symmetric basis functions and antisymmetric basis functions. If you're not convinced about that, just press the pause button, do the math yourself and come back whenever you're ready. So, to summarize, by making a change of basis, we constructed a basis composed of symmetric and antisymmetric functions. We now normalize those basis functions, assuming that E1, E2 and E3 are already normalized. We observed that we have now gathered six symmetric functions and three antisymmetric functions. And they are all of norm one. The number of symmetric and antisymmetric functions is as expected. The dimension of the symmetric part of this tensor product space is equal to six, and the dimension of the antisymmetric part of this tensor product space is equal to three. So now here we have a summary of these developments. And in fact, in the general case of two particles, Thus, for a space of dimension n delta squared, the dimension of the symmetric part of the space is equal to n delta times n delta plus 1 over 2, whereas the dimension of the antisymmetric part of the space is equal to n delta times n delta minus 1 divided by 2. 
we are now able to completely characterize the anti-symmetric tensor product space. And here is this precise definition for our simple test problem of two electrons and three basis functions. We remind that this definition does not depend either on the chosen basis for the one electron space. You can check yourself with a little exercise that the span of the antisymmetric functions generated by another basis, E1 prime, E2 prime, and E3 prime, is the same space by introducing a change of basis between those two bases. So, I gave you a specific example how to construct basis function of the antisymmetric tensor product space. Now, we switch back to Genevieve, who explains the general case. More generally, consider the one electron space V1 electron delta being of dimension n delta with basis function E1, E2 to E n delta. If we still consider a system with two electrons, then the antisymmetric tensor product space is the span of all the antisymmetric basis functions. These basis functions read 1 over square root of 2 EI tensor EJ minus EJ tensor EI for I and J being between 1 and N delta. If you consider a system with N electrons, a natural extension of the previous antisymmetric basis functions is the notion of slatter determinants. A slatter determinant is nothing else than a normalized antisymmetric product of n functions, where n is the number of electrons, among the n delta basis functions, e1, e2 to e n delta. This product is indeed, by definition, a determinant. The shorthand notation that is usually used in chemistry is the one that appears now on the blackboard. Only the n orbitals forming the slatter determinants are given. The antisymmetric tensor product space of the one electron space V one electron delta is spanned by all the slatter determinants. More precisely, a basis of this space is composed of all the slatter determinants with orbitals being basis functions of the space V1 electron delta with strictly growing indices. Hence, the antisymmetric space is the span of all slatter determinants with strictly growing indices. So this is it for the definition of the discrete space of antisymmetric functions. Remember that we have identified three sources of error. The first one is the modeling error, the second one is the discretization error, and the third one is the solution error. Now the current computers are able to treat a very large amount of information, so the discretization error and the solution error can be reduced at a very low level. So we have to address the modeling error. We are interested in minimizing this modeling error and thus we are naturally led to go back to the Schrödinger model. In this video, we have explained how to define the discrete space of anti-symmetric function that is necessary in order to approximate the Schrödinger problem. This discrete space of anti-symmetric function is big. It is very big depending on the number of degrees of freedom we choose in the discrete one electron space. This is also due to the fact that a priori we use all possible determinants. In the next video we shall address this problem. And actually we will be guided in the detection of the most pertinent determinant in a side product from the Hartree-Fock approximation. Since the plan in the next video is to address the problem of correcting the modeling error, we shall assume that the discretization error and the solution error are reduced at minima.